I wish I had learned this truth many years ago. Be thankful for the days, good and bad. All right, welcome to another episode of Warrior vs. Zombie. And as always, I have an amazing guest for you, Alan Stevens, and I'll introduce him to you in a second from the other side of the planet today. So that's kind of exciting. But let me tell you why you're here. So success is a journey. It's not a destination. As warriors, we all have a history of ups and downs, wins and losses, that are all part of making us who we are up to this point, and they provide a foundation for our path forward. We all battle our inner zombie, as well as those zombies in our world, and in each episode I interview warriors who are aspiring leaders from all walks of life. Entrepreneurs, artists, health practitioners, business owners, literally any inspired leader that has a story to tell. These warriors have a cause, they have a unique value and a vision that goes generations into the future. And today's guest is absolutely no exception. Alan Stevens is an awesome warrior. He's an international profiling and communication specialist referred to as the leading authority on reading people globally by the UK Guardian. And the mentalist meets Dr. Phil, kind of more familiar with Dr. Phil, uh, by the Herald, and Alan is regularly featured on national TV, radio, in the world's press, profiling the likes of our leading politicians, TV and sports stars, as well as Britain's royalty. That's got to be fascinating. He's an Amazon number one best selling author and coach and trainer with 12 local, national, and international awards, winning Business Person of the Year, Education and Overall Business of 2020 and social change maker and man of influence in 2021. Alan teaches people how to understand themselves and read other people so that they can create better and longer lasting relationships in all areas of their lives. Internationally is consulted with the likes of Disney Films and Gillette, the Australian Federal Police. His latest community initiative is the Campfire Project, which I'm very fascinated and excited about, a safe place for men and women to give themselves permission to tell their stories, experience, and wisdom from around the world. Almost sounds like this podcast. His we, hashtag We Work Together initiative is what it's called. So, Alan Stevens, welcome to Warrior vs. Zombie. How are things in Australia today? Whereabouts in Australia are you? Just north of uh, Sydney in a place called Newcastle. And yes, it's uh, Friday morning here, and I believe Thursday over there. So for all your listeners, welcome to it, the uh, future. And <laughs> so it's very good to be here. Thanks for the invitation, David. Well, I love that. Yes, we are. I am I'm now traveling to the future here. So I'll see what I feel like tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. So, so that's fascinating. So what else is going on over there? I don't. I don't even know. I always. I, I spent some time over in your neck of the woods, over in New Zealand and Australia, a few quite a few years ago, working on a project with Telecom New Zealand. So I kind of have a little bit of perspective, but I've forgotten. So is it your? Is this fall there, or su- is that? Is it's, it's the opposite to you by uh, six months. We're in our summer uh, period starting to uh, move towards cooling down. So uh, it's into the, uh, well, from summer now into uh, the autumn starting. So, uh, yeah, well, you'll, you'll be warming up. We're starting to cool down. Yes, and I'm in Texas, so we are starting to warm up, although Tanya is on here and she's uh, she's in Las Vegas, so it's even a little warmer sometimes there. But, but yeah. Well, there's still some places there in uh, America where it's still snowing, so it's taking a little bit longer. Yeah, I lived in those places, to tell you the truth, and uh, I don't have any desire to go back. So I only go there to visit since I have some family in in Michigan, which is still getting snow and and uh, the temperatures are not to my liking. So I'm I was thankful to sell my snowblower. Well, let's do this. I really want to get into. I uh, you have such a a wealth of uh, 
story and a wealth of things that I want you to share with our audience. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll hear a little of our theme song, It's Not the Getting There by Ricky Jean Wright. And when we come back, I want to hear your story. So let's take a quick break and we'll be right back with Alan Stevens and Warrior vs. Zombie. But the miles become the teacher While the student learns real slow Traveling blind most of the time Wherever you go It's not the getting there It's the journey every day It's not a race to see Awesome. Well, uh, I'm glad you woke up to talk to me today, Alan. So that's exciting. So as I, before the quick break there, tell me, how did you get from where you started? And since you're like me, you probably have more story than you can possibly tell. But how did you get from where you started to where you are today? And then when you get to there, we'll talk about what you're doing today. Well, with the work that I'm, well, very quickly, the work I'm doing today is a profiler. But to get to that point, I was always uh, very bad at reading people. In fact, when I was much younger, I was pretty much a loner. My father died when I was three, and I lived with my mother and sister, and pretty much kept to myself. My main companions were the pets that I had, the dogs, the cats, etc. And uh, in my early 20s, after I did my training in our national telephone carrier over here, I uh, got put in charge of a group of men who were all older than me. I was 23, and my second in charge was uh, 38. And everybody else on the team were older as well. So without any leadership uh, skills, without any leadership training at all, I was put in charge of them. And we managed to turn that into the highest performing group in Australia to the point where I got on really well with the guys. Because that's when I started using things like uh, body language to understand them. In the uh, That was in the 1970s. So in the 1980s, I got involved with... Um, Psychometric profiling, being able to read people through their uh, asking questions, first of all, through DISC and Myers-Briggs and other programs, Enneagrams. But in the 80s, I got involved with the surf club and then became a surf lifesaver. And they taught me into being a patrol captain on the beach, you know, looking after people's safety. And the only reason they did that, I found out, was they gave me all the people that nobody else wanted on their patrol. Mm. So I turned that into the patrol of the year. And then they told me to be the club captain. And when there's a club captain, I kept that patrol together and kept one of the guys, promoted him into the uh, leader's role within the, as the patrol captain. And I stood away from the patrol and they uh, won the award again as uh, the leading uh, uh, group uh, of lead patrol. So they then taught me into being the zone supervisor looking after three beaches. And so here I am now having gone from being the youngest or the least experienced within the organization, being the youngest, now as the least experienced in the surf club, telling everybody who are the same age as me what to do, but they'd all been there since I were young kids and I joined in my 30s. And then in my in the early 90s, my first wife left. I had three sons to raise on my own. They were 4, 11 and 12. Wow. So from that, I'd been the, as I said, the youngest to the least experienced to right out of my depth, raising three boys. And to any women out there who are listening to this, I really got an appreciation for mothers, especially single mothers and what they have to go through in raising their uh, families. So it uh, got me looking at things a lot differently as I you know, got went through those um, areas. And it's always been adding more information and learning from those skills. And that's been pretty much my journey to where I am today. So that's fascinating. So you've had situations where you got thrown into them. You didn't basically start out really knowing how to read people or whatever, right? You were you were given some tools to work with. That can also be a, a major zombie, a major challenge, obviously, when you get thrown into things, especially leadership or things that you're dealing with people, right, where you have no training going in or you haven't had any mentoring or whatever so obviously you've thrived in that environment from the sounds of it but it definitely was a challenge that you have to overcome i find a lot of the millennials that i work with on this side of the globe and as clients or or just in counter that uh, i think we've continued that problem sometimes of not really teaching them the issues and the challenges 
and the techniques around dealing with relationship, right? I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. So the 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 and the, and you identified another zombie along your path, which was uh, you know the divorce thing. So you you so you actually raised your you had three boys and you raised yeah. them yeah. as a single dad. Yeah, they were four, eleven, and twelve when their mum left. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a, an eye opener for me. But I've got a very good uh, relationship with uh, the boys. But uh, I remarried so many years later. I remarried, and by that stage, my second oldest—sorry, oh, my youngest—was about sixteen years old. Okay. And he'd moved out with his mother to mm -hmm. live with her because he didn't like my uh, second wife and uh, the new wife. So the end result was that. After I'd only a short marriage, only there for about two years, my uh, wife came to me when he was actually 16, the old, first wife, I should say, came to me when he was uh, 16 years old and said, look, he's fighting with me all the time. He said, but when you take him out bush, you go camping, he comes back being respectful. But he's, uh, you know, within two weeks, we're fighting again. What can we do about it? And she said, you know, he doesn't respect me. He doesn't love me. And I said, well, yes, he does love you, the same as his brothers do. But you can understand he doesn't respect me because you left all those years ago when he was very young. He was only four years old. So I said, look, he needs to learn to respect you. And that's really my job. I'm his father because a woman's not going to teach him how to respect a woman if he doesn't respect the women. It's right. got to come from the man. And I'm the one who has the biggest problem with you. So therefore, yeah, it's my job. If you trust that I'm doing this for him and not for you, and she did, so the end result, so we built a relationship there where I, then she started getting more involved with the older boys as well. Good. And when uh, my second oldest was uh, just turning uh, 30, she needed somewhere to stay for um, uh, for three months. Then she said, look, can I stay at your place? You're living on your own now because all my boys have grown up and moved out to their own families. And uh, she said, yeah, can I be a lodger? And I said, separate lives, as long as we're not, yeah, there's nothing else going on. I run my business and everything else. You give me the space. And she said, yes. Well, she moved out three and a half years later. And a lot oh. of people have said to me, how could you have actually lived with somebody who had told you you weren't good enough to be a husband and walked out on you and left you with three sons to raise on your own? And I said, I could hate her for the way that she, uh, by her, the fact that she left me and left us, but I could love her from the fact that she gave me three boys that I love and respect. If that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been together. So I could change the attitude I had towards her. And yes, it didn't stop me pushing her buttons every now and then because that's a profile or I know how to read people. <laughs> Just practicing my skills, by the way. <laughs> Having a bit of fun with that along the way. But um, you know, we've say, still got an amicable arrangement. And uh, my oldest boy now, he's uh, 42 years old. Wow. So... As I looked at it, it's been, as you said, we've got those warrior versus zombies. It's all those zombie moments in our life that if we look at it from the positive side, because everything's got two sides to it. Now, I could say that everything's happened in my life. At the time, the negative things were, were horrible, but they have made me who I am today. And that being the case, I like who I am. I'm about to turn 71. So I've been on the planet for a long time. A lot of things have happened in that period of time. But I'm happy to do who I am and of the things I've been through in the past. I can look at those now and they no longer have a negative effect on me. Because everything that happens now, I'm looking for what's the learning of my getting from this. Oh. There's always a positive side to it. And we're always saying, yeah, well, I don't didn't have the resources to handle at the time, but what resources I've been able to create now. And where do I go to from here? Yeah, I love that. That's such a powerful lesson. And since we have more journey behind us, we know that everything in life is about challenge and support, not just support. I mean, if you right. think everything is going to support what we're doing at any given point in time, then you're living in a fantasy. And if you see only the challenge, then you're depressed. So the reality of it is being in the moment as a warrior, as it's obvious you are, you realize that with everything comes, even the, the stint you, you went with your boy's mom together for like three and a half years, that had to have been 
you know, some oper- it might have been some fun in some cases, but it was also probably a challenge. And then continuing to to raise them that there were probably things that you had to learn to appreciate, like you said, about women that really didn't realize the role that you were picking up there that you gain an appreciation for. As I said, I've got four daughters and my son is the youngest. And I figured that God gave me that because I wasn't a great guy when I was, when I was young. So I figure he said, I'm going to show you what it's like on the other side of that to deal with guys like you that hurt girls or hurt, not in a physical way, obviously, but in the, in just in a, being a jerk. Uh, so I, the, the, the boys hadn't respected their mother. They never would have respected women in their life and they wouldn't have found the partners they found. And so that's why I did it. But at the same time, you've got four daughters. You know, I both realized I had a better deal than you because at some point, even though the boys falling out of trees and doing all this stuff that drove me crazy when they were younger, I knew at some point in their life, they were going to become another man's problem hmm. to the man who had daughters because they'd be chasing their daughters. <laughs> 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 so I don't envy you as your daughters grow up. Yeah, it was a challenge. Now I've got a bunch. I've got six grandkids, and four of them are granddaughters. So again, I'm I'm taking what I've learned, or and hope continuing to refine that. I don't think I've got it figured out by any stretch of the imagination. So what else? Any other challenges along the way? Anything that getting to where? you are today it's I, i'm just fascinated by the whole profiling concept and and that whole thing and when we talked before some of the the things that you were doing i want to get into that in a sec but before we get to what you're doing right now uh any other challenges how about covid in in australia did that present any challenges or did it just kind of was a, a non-event for for you guys over on that side of the planet it wasn't so much well for a lot of people in australia especially in melbourne they were the lockdown capital of the world mm-hmm. they had more days locked down than anywhere else in the world i'm in a, a lucky position because i've got clients all over the world i've always been online i was on skype and then when zoom came out i went on to that and now with uh, the uh, be connected version of meet i'm on that uh, network as well so I've progressed through to better systems all the time. So I've been online. For me, getting up in the morning, wearing boxer shorts, were one of the groups I'm involved in, and that when we're online, as we say, yeah, pants are optional. <laughs> we know that, you know, we've always got a good shirt on, but what's down below? It could be just a pair of boxer shorts or it could be a uh, your um, uh, board shorts. And I virtually live in board shorts through the summer. And that makes it really easy. So I get up, go into my office, which is at home based, go and do my uh, work in there and then just go back down the lounge room afterwards. So I could either spend more time or if I spend the same amount of time at work, I'm not traveling. So for me, COVID wasn't an issue as far as that went. It was a problem with going to places, wearing masks and being around people, going shopping and things like that. And it did restrict some of the live presentations I've been doing. Because right. there was none of that being being right at the time, but I think the you know because I run the group called the Campfire Project was all about helping men and women tell their stories. That all started with me back in my um, uh, early childhood because I said my father died when I was three. I got bullied just virtually every day at school, and uh, so my whole uh, relationships were pretty poor. And I've always been searching for relationships all my life, mm. and. I was actually nine when I tri- tried to commit suicide. That oh, was wow. the first attempt. And that was because I felt so disconnected. I wasn't connected to my mother or sister. I felt like I was just taking up space. My um, uncle, my mother's sister's husband, when uh, I got engaged, told my fiance at our engagement party she could do better than me. Hmm. So they're the sort of things that I grew up with. And it's like you know, I learned to swim. I was thrown at the deep end of the pool, and I had to learn how to swim that way. It's the same thing with most of the things I've been through in life, being thrown at the deep end. You know, the surf club, the being in charge of men and all the rest of it, and I've had to learn on the spot. So all of those things have given me the resilience that I needed, but I've always been searching for relationships and I was never really achieving them until I started looking at how do I help other people build their relationships. And that's when the relationships for me started really flowing through. 
So it taught me to look at how I was approaching things. You know, if we're desperately trying to get something, we probably need to step back from it and have a look at it and go, okay, what's another way of getting there? Because if what I'm doing is not working, as Einstein said, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result is insanity. And so that's why I've always looked at life in that way. It took me a long time to get to, to that point, probably around about after my second divorce, uh, around my 50s, that I've started to realize that uh, there were different ways of doing things. And in fact, that was when the big changes happened for me. After my second divorce, I had been a massage therapist while I was married to my second wife. She was one who taught me into becoming a massage therapist. She was as well, and she was an aromatherapist and taught that section of the course. And uh, after we separated, I put that on hold. Anyway, she, a few friends of mine taught me into giving them a massage, and they kept asking me where, where the extra hands come from. You know, well, how did the table move? And these are engineering types talking about mm-hmm. something I had no understanding of. Anyway, um, I opened my rooms up again, and I started getting terminal patients coming to me and some of them reversing their conditions. Huh was absolutely bizarre. I was a remedial masseuse, but all of a sudden I wasn't doing the same sort of massage. It just completely changed. And through uh, some chance meetings, I needed some answers to this and I met some Aboriginals. Got invited out bush, which ended up going out every weekend with them to learn their culture, to understand their their law, L-O-R-E, the culture that they, uh, because I needed answers to how was this happening and nobody in the Western society had the answers. So I went to the oldest living uh, culture on the planet. And through that, I learned from them, to the, and that's where they, I ended up going through initiation. So I went through that tribal process of boyhood into manhood. And I really would like to see more uh, people in Western society go through that because especially as boys, we don't have that anymore. That's why so many boys are growing up lost. That's why so many relationships don't last because we don't understand how to live our life in a more effective manner. And so that was where then things like the Campfire Project came from, you know, almost 16 years later. And it was always take anything that happens around you, look at it and go, okay, what can I learn from this? The most important thing I'll ever learn is the next thing I learn after I think I know everything. As they say, I think it was Einstein who said that little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing and so is too much knowledge so if we think we know everything we're going to start making problems we're going for ourselves we're going to make them for other people as well because our arrogance that we think we know everything will hold us back and i've always you know as i said i'm in my 70s and i'll continue learning till the day i die well i think that's brilliant and for sure from a warrior perspective we're always moving forward and we should always be learning. I mean, one of the things that I teach in my warrior networking community is the fact that every interaction with every human being, just one-to-one getting to know is an opportunity to learn. And if you're not learning something in that, in, in that encounter, then chances are you're leaving money or value on the table because everybody I don't care how young, how old, how much journey they have, what their story has been, that they all teach us things. Every one of these episodes, I, you know, and I get the feedback from the audiences, they, they learn so much, not just from the things that people are doing today, but also the journey that they've been on. And yours is a fascinating one. Well, let's do this. Let's take a quick break because I want to get into talking about the things you're doing today, the things you're focused on, all of the, you know, campfire project, whatever you want to share. I want to kind of hear a lot about that after we take a quick break. All right. So we'll take a quick break, hear a little more of our theme song. It's not the getting there by Ricky Jean Wright. And we'll be right back with Alan Stevens and Warrior vs. Zombie. race to see how many people Know your name One day you realize Time was worth More than the gold It's not the getting there When you get there you'll know 
Funny how wisdom and youth are always two different games. All right, Alan. Fascinating. I had uh, remembered a few of the things you shared from when we talked before and got to know each other a little bit, but I still am just blown away by the journey you've been on. And by the way, just so you know, I'm going to say this as an old guy myself, you don't look like you're in your 70s. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say, and I, I always like to hear that I don't look like I'm in my late sixties either. So, so, uh, you know, so we're pretty close demographically and I'm working on a hundred, I want to be 120 with the vitality of a 30 year old. So I got to work hard to, for the vitality side and, uh, obviously, uh, keeping my engine running for, uh, to 120 is, is going to take some work too. So anyway, as I said before the break, I want to hear about kind of why you're doing what you're doing. What's the... What is it that you're doing today? And then obviously there's a lot of value with your things you've experienced, but tell me about that. Well, first of all, on the business side, as I already said, I'm a profiling and communication specialist. What I do is I help people to be able to read other people without even needing to ask a single question. Many years ago, I was brought in by a company that taught currency trading here in Australia, and none of the students have made any money, and they wanted to find out why. In those days, I used to use psychometric profiling like Myers Briggs and DISC. And we went in and I realized that the two people who were the two directors, husband and wife, who were running the group had no connection to people at all. They, they didn't have that connection with their, uh, the clients that were coming in. Anyway, I profiled them. Then I profiled all the students that were coming in. And we realized that we needed to teach to their personalities because they weren't making that connection originally. The end result was that um, when we started training them, people on all the technical tools, they still weren't making money when they finished their training. They were actually losing money. And I realized that some of them didn't match their personalities. And I knew that we needed a better way of reading people because asking questions, people will try and second guess what you're asking. And a couple of the people I asked, I said, why didn't you, yeah, this is your personality profile we got. Why do you operate differently? I said, why did you get that particular profile to start? And they said, oh, we tried to second guess what sort of a personality we had to have to be a a great trader. I'm going, no, when you're stressed, your personality is going to come out. That's one we need to know. And I realized I needed a better way of reading people. And it was through um, some uh, chance conversation with a gentleman who just said one day, you ever looked at reading faces? I went, that sounds pretty interesting. And I had, from where we were meeting, I was running a, a retreat uh, where we were doing Myers-Briggs uh, workshop. And uh, so I drove home from there. It was about an hour away from my place and thinking all the way, thank you, uh, Dr. Google, Professor Google. I got onto Google and found uh, Paul Ekman. He did all the research on the micro expressions. And so I looked at their training and started doing training there. At the same time, I met a lady by the name of Nami Tickle, an English lady who lives in California now retired, but at the time she was working with facial features. And I thought originally when I, and probably anybody who's listening to this is thinking facial features and personalities, it sounds a bit woo-woo. And that's what I thought of originally, but I had a conversation with her. And I then realized, I started to connect the dots and I realized, well, if you lift weights, you're going to build muscles in your body. At the same time, everything we feel inside, we express outwardly. That's why body language and micro expressions and all those areas work as a science and so i realized if you put the two together you pull expressions over and over and you're going to create ridges and crevices on your face that give away your personality so now there's no hiding your personality because your face is a roadmap of your past and so if i can see that i've got your personality i know how to speak to you in the way that you need to be spoken to so in other words tuning my transmitter into your receiver and once i do that then I've got the body language and the micro expressions that give me the feedback. Have I read you right? Is there something emotionally going on? And are you telling me the truth? But I use the micro expression and body language not as a lie detector, but as a truth seeker. Because I want to build a relationship with you. Mm-hmm. Yes, Paul and all those people who work with the micro expressions, working with the CIA, your border controls, and all those sort of groups, FBI, they are teaching them to catch criminals. Right. I'm talking about building relationships with the broader population because 
the broader population aren't the ones committing criminal crimes. So I really wanted to be able to build a stronger relationship. So I said, okay, use as a truth seeker. And so with that, as you said, I work with large corporations. I'm doing a lot of work at the moment with businesses of all sizes. But the area I really love working with is with parents and school teachers because we've got far too many kids being diagnosed with conditions they don't have because we've become over the, each generation's getting less tolerant of the previous generation, uh, the next generation that's coming through. And our resilience to raising children is getting less and less. So now we've got to medicate the kids into a system that needs to be changed in the first place. So we're trying to change the kids where we should have been changing our systems. If you're able to read someone's personality, you need to know how to talk to them in the way that they need to be spoken to. The moment you talk to them in the way that they need to be spoken to, you've got a better connection with them. And if it's a child with Asperger's or um, I don't know what to call it, uh, ADHD or autism or anything like that, you're, they're not going to get triggered as much because you're talking their language. And if you do that, you can reduce their medication. And I've got uh, my parents here in Australia, overseas there in America, but also one mother in particular who's still doing testimonial videos for me 12 years after I profiled her son, who was six years old at the time. School didn't want him, after school's care didn't want him. They wanted him to be medicated. She didn't want that to happen. The end result was I did a profile of uh, the boy from his photographs. Because as I said, face doesn't change when you look at the personality overnight. So if I've got your photograph, I've got your uh, profile. I wrote a report that she gave to the school, the after school's care, and she played one against the other, telling each of them, if you do this, it's going to work. But if either of you don't do it, then it's going to fail. It's going to be on your head. So she played one against the other. They put it in place. And at the age of seven, when they said he'd never do presentations in front of the class, he was doing presentations in front of the class. A year and a half later, they let the psychologist go because they didn't need him anymore. And uh, medication was off the table completely. The doctor approved and said, no, nah, no way that you need to medicate him. Because we taught everybody else how to talk to him so he didn't get triggered. He's now 18 and he's an entrepreneur. Wow. And so that never would have happened if he'd been medicated, dumbed down to fit the system instead of changing the environment around him that uh, gave him a completely different life. And everyone that I've done that with around the world have got positive results. And my target now is to get my skills into the hands of every school teacher in the Western world. Because if we do, our kids are going to grow up happier. They're, going, they're happier at uh, school. They're going to be more productive because they then want to learn. They then go out into the workforce. And by the way, the profile will tell me the hobbies and sports that will see the child. And we can pick those up in the very early days when they're still a toddler. Before they pick their final subjects at school, there's enough traits there to work out what careers will match their personalities so we can send them off to do the right studies. Because how many kids do we know? Go off to university, do a degree, don't work in that field. Go and do another degree, don't work in that field. And in fact, I've even heard of some psychologists and that uh, with their clients actually asking if they would like fries with that because they're working at McDonald's. Hmm. They've done the degree, but don't want to work in that field. They can't handle it. And that was the only reason they went into that is because everyone's saying you should go into that uh, profession because you'll make a lot of money. And yes, you need to make a lot of money because if you're miserable in the job, you're going to need a good amount of money to cover your medication that you need and need some holidays to be able to get away from everything. So, But if you're doing something you love, you never feel that you've ever worked a day in your life. You feel happy. If you find the right career, you've gone into that, you're happier at work. If you're happier at work, you're happier at home. If you're happier at home, there's less domestic violence. If you and your partner are happy, then your kids are going to be happier as well. If your kids are happier, they're not going to school and bullying other people because people who bully other people are people who have been bullied themselves. So we're breaking all of those cycles. By you. This is my passion to get this. Parents and school teachers to be using this so that we change the, um, we change the whole situation for people around the world. We, we create our new communities and new behaviours. And that led on to the Campfire Project because I realised a lot of men in particular weren't happy in their workplace and weren't happy at so work, at, at home. Because at home they thought their job was to go out and bring the resources in. But now their partners are telling them that they're absent physically or emotionally because mm -hmm. they're out at work to spend too many hours of coming home exhausted. 
And the men are saying, well, we can't be in the same place, in two places at the same time. Which, which way do you want it? At the same time in the workplace with gender equality and political correctness, all the confusion that was coming from that and men worried about saying the wrong thing and being yeah. hauled up and put it, you know, by HR or, you know, whoever this employers for sexual harassment or whatever. So when you concentrate on something and worry about it, you actually manifest more of it. Mm. So those two problems, I realized that men were getting angry, which was you know, frustrated to anger in some cases, bullying the workplace and even going home domestic violence. So I realized that we needed to give men a safe place where they could uh, talk without judgment, without criticism, and uh, just have somebody be the eyes and ears that they hadn't had before. Now, because I could read people so effective, that became so easy for me to do. So I put together the Campfire Project, originally for men to be able to tell their stories. But I realized that a long time ago that me too, men too, all the men's groups and all the women's groups are vital to pick up the problems that we have in our society, but they are never going to be the solution to equality and um, inclusion because they're always pointing fingers. It had to be hashtag we together, both shoulder to shoulder, men and women looking at the problems. But I realized the men had to feel that they were leading the way. So by interviewing them first, then bringing them into panel discussions and then saying, all right, let's talk about the issues affecting us today. How is it affecting your children? How, you know, what do we need to do to change those situations? How do we need to improve our relationship? How do we need to improve our communities? And I had women in the group from day one so they could hear this because I wanted them to hear how men could speak when the men felt safe to do so. And so that was when the women started sending me personal messages. And that little noise on the, the thing a moment ago was one of those uh, women ringing me to catch up uh, because uh, the women said to me, look, we love these guys. We've never heard men talk so deeply about their emotions nor so wisely about how to improve our society. We would love to uh, get involved. What can we do? We said, put your hands up. I've been waiting for it. So I brought the women into the one-on-ones, into the panel discussions. In getting up to five years, it'll be five years in August on the 13th, we'll have had um, almost 600 hours or almost 600 hours of conversations now, one-on-ones and panel discussions. We've talked about Drugs, alcohol, masculinity, femininity, the toxicity of those things. We've talked about, so when the women came into it, we talked about menstruation, menopause. We're talking mm. about size matter in the bedroom. No subjects off the table. We'll talk about anything. And in that time, we've got a whole range of genders, uh, religions, cultures in the group. And not once have we had any racism, sexism, or bigotry. Mm-hmm. And nothing but... To, uh, respect all the way through. There's never been anyone disrespectful to anybody else. And virtually proving that the Campfire Project is the only group that I've been able to find worldwide that has fostered and actually created total inclusion and total equality. And we did that because it was get away from pointing the fingers and creating a group that just tries to, like, me too was necessary to highlight the problems of the pendulum swung. So then men too saw some abuse that was going on and they got involved in the pendulum swings again. While the pendulum swinging, we're never going to have equality. We had to get that pendulum back to the middle point. And it's only when we got, we worked shoulder to shoulder, looking at the problem, not pointing fingers at each other, that we can actually fix the problems. And the men and the women, the amount of respect that they have for each other, it's absolutely beautiful to listen to. That is so powerful. And, and there's so many things that I can, that our audience can learn from that. But one of the things that it speaks to me or one of the things I hear is that we've got to get to the root cause, if you will, or get to the root of the conversation that we're having with each other and realize that, that we bring each bring ourselves to the conversation and that's okay, that we need to respect and understand and not expect conformity, the whole equity, you know, some of that stuff to me is misused or mislabeled because it's forcing us to focus on the differences rather than when you really look at it. I mean, I life is very simple for me. I mean, I'm a Christian and I don't know whether you are or not, but I but that's okay. It's because I only have two jobs. One is I have to love you. And the other one is I love God. So I've got two, and, and I don't have to like you. 
I don't have to even see the world the way you do, but I have to, in love, I have to figure out how it is to love you, how, how I can continue forward. And I don't care whether you're a man, a woman, I don't care how much melanin you got in your you know, skin. I, none of that should matter because we're all warriors, humans on this planet, and we all should be figuring out how to love and serve each other as we go forward at a micro level using one of your, you know, micro expressions, but micro level. I mean, I think that's brilliant. So what else, any other things as far as, so are you looking to impact change the world? What's the, if, if anything were possible and oh, by the way, I believe everything is possible. What kind of impact would you hope to have when you get to 120 by, you know, yourself? Well, I know by the time I get to 120, I get up in the mornings now and I you know, make a bit of noise when I'm walking across the out of the bedroom, off to the <laughs> or whatever. And I always, always say to people, it's not that I'm getting old, I'm just getting crispy. Yeah. <laughs> Got to look after the body, you know, as you said, as we go along. But just to go back to that point for a moment, one of the things that I realized was that it, you know, if you, people say to you, well, are you this or are you that? Somebody asked me if I'm a Christian. And I tell them, you tell me, you watch me yeah. and tell me by the way that I treat the back and why that. You ask me if I'm a man. You, that, because it's a perception. It's what people see we as, see as, as, as who we are. Well, one person can look at you and really love you. Another person can look at you and really loathe you. Which one's right? In their realities, they're both right because that's their reality. That's right. I can only be who I am. And all I can then be is the best version of me. And by doing that is finding out all the, the errors, all the little things that I've done wrong in the past, all the little uh, parts that I can improve on. And I look at that point of view, and I'll, that's why I always say I'm always going to be learning. The whole thing is that one thing I have learned over the years is that what you do for yourself dies with you. But what you do for others and for the community isn't always will be eternal. And so where I first started out, I needed to have relationship. That was all about me. In the later part of my life, it all turned around the other way. And I started realizing, well, how do I help other people? And so with that, that's where my growth, I think, started to happen. But I'm a work in progress. We all are. We're always going to be going through. At the same time, as I said, you'll see things that you've done in your past. And anybody who uses a term that they're ashamed of the, something they've done in the past, I've only got one thing to say to you. First of all, did you do it deliberately or with, you did the best that you had with the information you had at the time. If you didn't do it deliberately, knowing it was a wrong thing, then you've got nothing to be ashamed of. You have no right to sh uh, to use the word shame because now you're going to try and fix the shame. You're trying to fix something that doesn't exist. You'll never fix it. So, yes, regret the things you've done. There's a handful of things that I regret in my past that I would have liked to have done differently. But as I said, that was the learning process all the way through. As I mentioned before, I had tried to commit suicide when I was nine. I tried after my second, after my first divorce. I was thinking about it, but never tried it. That doesn't make me a weak person. By pointing out that, it shows other people I understand what they're going through. If I really want to connect with somebody, I have to connect and show them who I am so that they can then know whether they like and whether they trust me because they're not going to open up and talk to me unless they have that information. So being vulnerable is showing strength. So anybody who thinks, because at the moment, we've still got this stigma around mental health. I would like to see that disappear completely because yeah. we're all on the mental health scale. There's a good number of people who will be at one end and the happier most of their life and just have those couple of days where they stub their toes or whatever it might be. Others who life is... You know, it's a drudgery every day. It's, you know, the, why, should, why am I here? Where we are on that scale just depends on our circumstances and the information that we have at the time. So by, if you if somebody who's going through a tough time, and this is where the charity, the Business of Smiles, came out of the Campfire Project. We go out into the streets wearing big smiley T-shirts, wearing these bright yellow soft little black dots on them. The little black dots we explain to everybody because we walk up to people and thank them for doing their best. And they, they go, what are you talking about? And we say, well, look, have you done anything deliberately wrong? 
Have you been looking after the people around you, people being there for you, et cetera? And you've been trying to be your, your best version. They go, yes. And I go, well, we just want to thank you for doing yeah. that. Yeah. And by the way, can we gift you the pair of socks? Then we tell them the story of the socks, little black dots, tough times you're going to go through in their life. That's what they recognize. The resemble is the rec- that they are the, the tough times. But the yellow reminds us, because it's more yellow in the socks, there are more sunny days than there are dark days. But the yellow also represents the support that you give others and the support that others give you. And if you've got enough support around you and you're giving enough support, then those dark days never join up and it doesn't turn into a bleak light. And we do that by having connection with other people. I've told my story in its entirety to the within the Campfire Project because if I want other people to open up, and I've had all genders in there telling their stories, men who had transitioned to females, females who had transitioned to males, gays, lesbians, etc. The oldest person I've interviewed was 99 years old. The youngest mm-hmm. person to actually interview his father, who, was, who his father also actually interviewed his own father beforehand. And now three generations that weren't really connecting because the grandfather had moved up away from his son when he was, his son was uh, before he was 14, 30 years earlier. And he was now, um, by the age of 14, Scott, the mm-hmm. middle one, was on uh, on the streets. He then interviewed his father because he wanted to understand his father. Not point blame at him, but understand why he made the decisions he's made. That got him and his father connected. Then his son decided he wanted to interview him. Nine years old. Held his own uh, interview for almost an hour with questions like, why is it, Dad, you can give to everybody else, but you can't receive yourself? And he researched all his own questions. This is a very astute young nine-year-old. Mm. He's not 11 going on 12, and he's now connected to his grandfather who he never met before. So we've got three generations coming together. All of those is because people were willing to be vulnerable and show who they really were. Because when I met Scott originally, he was worried about what I thought of him. So I told him what I thought of him. And I brought him into the Campfire Project, got him to tell his story, got him to start running panel discussions, asked him then if he was going to step up and run interviews. And he's going, hang on, he was an ex bikey He'd been through a pretty tough life. He said, who am I to do this? I said, who are you not to do it? And I gave him that support and he stepped up to it because doing this work and reading people, I can see the beauty in everyone. I can see the gifts that they bring. Every trade we have has an upside and every trade we have has a downside. The upside is where our strengths are. And if we focus on those, we have a happy life. We're doing the jobs that we uh, love doing. We know how to talk to our partners and understand them, especially when we understand the downside, because we know how to set our environment up so they don't get triggered. We can recognize the downside in other people's traits. We know how to talk to them so that doesn't get triggered. I've had couples who were falling apart, taught them about each other's personality, showed them how to talk to each other differently, and the spices immediately come back into their marriage. Oh, yeah. And so this is the, the work that I love doing. Everything is based on relationships. This is what which keep, keeps me young because I get to be, have these people sit in front of me, tell me their stories. They're worried about what I think of them. Every last one of them, I feel honoured and have been very grateful that they've seen enough in me to actually sit there and tell me the story that they've been told anybody else before in their life. That, to me, is my biggest gift that I receive. Oh, yeah. I get more out of that than I think they get out of it. I have had people at the end of it go after they've told their story, saying that's the best therapy I've ever had. And I go, well, would you like to thank the therapist? And they go, yeah. And I go, okay, get off the call, go to look in the mirror and say thank you to yourself. Because I don't ask a lot of questions. I just instigate a few questions. And once they, they start talking, where they said, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. Next thing you know, they're talking for the best part of an hour. Mm-hmm. And what they're talking about is their unconscious mind now is finally opening up and their conscious mind is listening to it. And so they finally listen to what their conscious mind has been trying to tell them for ages. And if you don't listen to it, the, the unconscious mind will bring it out in the body with injuries and illnesses and other things trying to get our attention. Well, now they're listening to that. I watch their postures change while they're sitting there on the screen from the beginning of the story to the end of the story becoming more relaxed and more open and everything goes. And I go, well, you've had the best therapist you could have got. Your unconscious mind, you finally listened to it. So go thank it. That's cool. I mean, I the way in my terminology, I'd say that's the warrior 
interviewing the zombie almost. It's basically that 95% of the, the things in your mind that are, are there to protect you from feeling that pain or going through that, what might you might perceive as a negative experience, but until you really understand what's behind that veil or what's not, you know, what's there in your unconscious mind, as you call it, then you're, you're kind of constrained. You're put in a box. Well, I love that. Let's, um, I'm, we're going to have to, I, I could talk for a while, by the way, just before I forget, I'm, um, starting another podcast called triggered by warrior versus zombie. And I'm going to already put it out there that I'm, we'll come back and it's topical and we're going to drill down into the area of whatever tr was triggered by this conversation on our introductory warrior versus zombie episode. So just put that in your thought process and figure out, and we'll talk about what we could do there. But for now, we're gonna have to take a quick break. Here, one more snippet of our theme song, it's not to get in there. And then we'll come back and we come back, I'm gonna give you a minute, think about if I take away anything, one or two things, if they're listening to this podcast, what would you want us to take away? And then we'll be, so we'll be right back, hear a little of our theme song, and we'll hear more from Alan Stevens at Warrior vs. Zombie. Funny how wisdom and youth are always two different games. The years flew by so fast is the common human complaint. Memories in our minds Turn to diamonds in our soul And by the grace of God On down the road we go So Alan, as I said before the break, if we take away it's anything from this podcast or from this discussion, your story, what you're doing today, what would you hope that we take away? Well, I mentioned it before and that... that uh, a couple of things. Just remember that the most important thing that anybody will ever learn is the next thing they learn after they think it, they know everything. Keep an open mind. But don't be taken in by everything you hear either. It's a case of, well, I know there's an old Arabic saying that we said that trust everybody but lock up your camels at night. So listen to everything, learn from people. Because if you ask me who were the, the greatest mentors in my life, you won't hear me saying Jim Rohn or Anthony Rob, the Tony Robbins or you know, uh, any of the uh, those uh, top uh, speakers. You'll hear me talking about the 10-year-olds, the nine-year-olds I used to examine at the surf club and when I asked them how they see the surf, I saw the surf through their eyes. I learned from young children when I wasn't, uh, I was getting stressed about things. I learned how to play a game by watching young children play and watching their attitudes towards each other because they don't recognise colour. Mm -hmm. different cultures and things like that so those teachers so always having an open mind but always back looking at it and reassessing what i'm hearing from people and making sure that that fits what i want to do at the same time what you do for you for yourself dies with you but what you do for others and for the community isn't always going to be eternal and in fact when you are building relationships to help other people your life gets enriched so much more than if you're just out there trying to enrich your own so they're two things that I like to leave with people, but very basically, leave the planet in the better state that you found it. The same as if I borrow tools from somebody, they always go back cleaner than when they came to me. I love that. And uh, my dad taught me that when I was young, is never give back anything that you borrow. And, and, and I love that. The other thing is, you said it a couple of times, and, and I'm glad that that was one of the key points, which is the only thing you can take into eternity is people. The only thing that you can take is those relationships, the people that you have. Everything else where it's, like you say, focused on you, it dies with you, if you will. But your story, getting your story out, investing in your community, in your network to make it a better place is where things go beyond your own lifespan. And I love that. So... How do we stay in touch? I know you're on the Be Connected platform. That's how we became connected. But how else can we find you if we're listening to this podcast and we want to circle back with you? Well, as I always say to people on that, yeah, if they're not on the Be Connected platform, they should get on here and uh, get their own uh, profiles up there as well. But the best way to find me is through my website. And the 
that's quite easy. You've seen my name on screen there, alanstevens.com.au for Australia. They can also find me on LinkedIn through, uh, just do a search on Reading Faces. And I'll see my uh, face there very quickly. And they've also got um, a business uh, page or a company page there for my uh, human pattern recognition, but also for the Campfire Project as well, where we're putting the panel discussion. The one-on-ones don't go out of the Campfire Project, which is the Facebook group, because uh, I'm protecting everybody in there from the trolls. Sure. Uh, a lot of people out there who are very unhappy. And on that score, by the way, David, I'd love to invite you into the Campfire Project to talk about Warriors versus Zombies and your new podcast, because the the whole focus of the Campfire Project is create greater communities, and that means bringing other people who are running their own groups into the Campfire Project where they can tell their stories, they get credibility when they do that, because people understand who they are. And then if they're running projects and or events and things like that, we will advertise that for them free of charge. The Campfire Project is my passion project. The only person who won't make money out of it is me, and that's been made deliberately so it stays, and because otherwise it never would have got to where it is today if it turned into a business. But anybody who's a coach, you want to tell your story, yeah, you, 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 know, you, uh, you do that. If you pick up clients through there, that's between you and them. We don't make any money out of that. At the same time, if you're running events, we will advertise that. If you're running a group, Men's groups, women's group, we would love to have you come in, share that story with people because we can support you. You've got more chance of surviving because everyone's doing it tough. And when a person's running their own group and doing it tough by meeting others in the panel discussions, they get to know each other mm -hmm. and now they've got peer support. So I'm networking in multiple levels and bringing people together. I love it. And frankly, that's why I'm so passionate about the Speak Connected platform being in 115 countries. Because I run a local network of um, a couple thousand people here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And I'm always now wanting to take that influence, that learning, that impact beyond the geographic boundaries. And I think COVID kind of was a kickstart. It forced us to do things that were probably already happening anyway. But I'm so thankful that I got to meet you. Alan, thank you for for sharing your vision. Thank you for sharing your story with our audience. And I'm certain we are going to have other interactions as we yeah, move it forward. So we're in the Beach Connect the network, if I could just quickly add there, sure. we've also got a group in there for the profiling, the human back recognition side of things. And we've also got the um, a closed group for the campfire project, which eventually I'm hoping to move everything off Facebook and onto the Be Connected network because I love the ethics here. Yeah, I do too. And actually I'm doing the exact same thing um, with our moving off of the Facebook groups and those kinds of things. It takes a little bit of a transition time, but yeah, we're working on that. Well, it's been great, Alan. And thank you again for uh, starting your Friday off with us here on the other side at later on Thursday, but uh, I'm sure we're going to be going down the road together. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right. So I think we're going to land the plane for this. segment. We'll hear the final outro of our theme song. It's not to get there. And we'll be back next week with another warrior on Warrior vs. Zombie. It's not the getting there. It's the journey every day. It's not a race to see. How many people know your name? One day you realize Time was worth more than the gold It's not the getting there When you get there you'll know One day you realize Time was worth more than the gold It's not the getting there When you get there, you'll know